My name is Martha Hipley, and I'm excited to talk with you all about some ideas I've been exploring in my own work around gender and digital design. I've worked in both extremely commercial software spaces and much more radical creative spaces as a designer, developer, and artist. And I find at both extremes that there often isn't much conversation about the relationship between our identities and the tools we use and the way we create digitally. This talk is going to be a mix of case studies, observations from my own career, as well as hands-on activities that I invite you to use in your own creative practice. To kick it off, a game I like to play in workshops is to ask everyone to take a look at the software they use the most. What's on your home screen on your phone, or on your dock or start menu on your computer, or on the bookmarks bar on your browser? Now look at those apps and decide the gender for them. You have to make a choice. It has to be on the very Western gender binary, and you have to make it quickly. Is Twitter a boy or a girl? Is Instagram a boy or a girl? What about Photoshop or Spotify? What I've found is that once you get going, it can feel quite funny and also instinctual to group these inanimate things. But then we want to talk about why. There are usually a lot of reasons why we group these things the way we do that are mixed up and messy and influenced and informed by our personal experiences, our culture, our politics. An easy example is PayPal. Everyone always seems to say quite quickly that PayPal is a boy. But why does it feel like a boy? Well, there's the obvious aesthetic reasons. Blue is for boys, the interface is quite cold and impersonal. It feels very purpose-driven, but also a bit convoluted. It's almost undesigned. It's definitely not pretty, and it hasn't changed very much since the time that PayPal was founded. And then there's the functional reasons. PayPal is about money, it's about commerce and capitalism and power, things we tend to associate with masculinity in a very Western lens. It's a boy because of what it does and how it functions in our life. I once ran a workshop where someone complained that they think of PayPal as a boy because it dead names them, and they associate that behavior with toxic masculinity. And if you've ever tried to contact PayPal support, you know that there's nothing nurturing or gentle about the product, nothing that we would associate with femininity. And PayPal is also a boy because we associate it with very public creators who have very public reputations around their masculinity or maybe the fragility of it. They're called the PayPal Mafia and not the PayPal Coven for a reason. It's hard for me personally to think about PayPal without thinking about Peter Thiel helping Sue Gawker into bankruptcy for making allegations about his sexuality, or Elon Musk's very obvious and public obsession with rockets and trains. Most digital experiences don't have creators who are as obsessed with being in the public eye as Elon Musk, but we can't separate their identities away from what they make. So somehow, a little square in our phone screens that we tap every day can have all of these loaded associations that radiate out into the world, creating chaos and unforeseen consequences. So what I want to talk about now is how we can interrogate these associations. The creator relationship, the functionality of these tools, the aesthetics, in order to make space in our own work for a little more humility and optimism and play. So let's start with the creator relationship. I've worked in design and UX for over a decade, and there's a fantasy that user experience design is about empathy, as illustrated by the proliferance of these kind of graphs that you'll see on many UX and design blogs. But in practice, it's really about a small group of people making decisions that might end up scaling up to affect a lot of people. In your own work, you're the first person who will experience it. And by default, that's going to have a lot of influence on what you're making. A case study I like to use is the design of the computer mouse. It's literally the first chapter of Bill Moggridge's book, Designing Interactions, which is even used as a textbook in some interaction design programs. This quote, I think, really exemplifies how the design community thinks about this case study. There is an objectivity in this process of letting the user decide, the value of which is a recurring theme in this story of designing the desktop and the mouse. Come up with an idea, build a prototype, and try it again on the intended users. That has proved, time and again, to be the best way to create innovative solutions. So the mouse was co-invented by Bill English and Doug Engelbart in the mid-60s, and as you can see, 
The Engelbert mouse is not that different from the contemporary gaming mouse. They have basically the same form and functionality and have for the entire life cycle of this object. I have personally read this story about the brilliance of the invention of the mouse a dozen times. When Bill English died a few years ago, there were tons of glowing articles in seemingly every tech and design blog about how important this process was. So I eventually decided that I wanted to look up the original paper that was written about this experiment. In addition to the early mouse, they were testing a light pen used by radar operators as well as a knee control they designed. Now, the traditional narrative of this case study is that they tested a bunch of naive users to see what worked best, and that's how we've arrived at what we see today in mice. The reality is, there are only 11 participants in the study. All are presumably male and are only referred to as he in the original paper. Only three of those people were truly naive or unbiased. The other eight were experienced users with the light pen. And the results of the experiment were quite surprising to me. The experienced users had an easier time with the mouse than the light pen, but it's more or less attributed to the fact that the mouse weighed less. The experienced users also were never able to test the knee control because it wasn't ready in time for them. The inexperienced users surprisingly found the knee control the easiest device of the three. So why do we end up with the mouse? Well, Based on the amount of paper that's spent on describing the design and mathematics behind the mouse, I suspect there's a little bit of ego involved and in wanting to continue working on the problem that seemed the most interesting. And now as a culture, we're stuck in a sunk cost UI of mice being the dominant form of interaction with computers. Computer users use the mouse almost three times as much as the keyboard, and the mice, mouse requires small exact movements that overuse muscles in the hand, fingers, and thumbs. This causes all kinds of health issues for many people globally. There's an entire secondary market of products like wrist braces and gel pads to try and alleviate these ergonomic issues. The sunk cost has gone too far, and now we've even forgotten our poor, beautiful knee control that never got the respect it deserved. I think a lot about the myth of Pygmalion and Galatea. If we're looking to the ancient world for a concept of com computing, it's easy to go to the idea of mechanical automata as seen in the Iliad, but I think we're really living in a world full of mass-produced Galateas. In the myth, Pygmalion falls in love with his own sculpture of a beautiful woman, and the goddess Aphrodite brings it to life. It's an image of a genius crea creator obsessed with making the perfect thing to meet his personal needs, and it's no surprise to me that the myth was a popular artistic trope right around the same time as the Industrial Revolution. It's not that far from the fantasy of the captain of industry creating the perfect product for the masses. And it's this very masculine fantasy of creating a woman who is better than the real thing, something that is perfect, that is really pervasive in our pop culture to this day. The perfect experience for you is not the perfect experience for everyone. And a lot of people are trapped in mediocre or even toxic digital loops today because the person who designed their experience doesn't understand them or their needs. A huge part of this is that the demographics of who are creating these digital experiences doesn't match the demographics of who are using them. Just to speak specifically about gender and sexuality, women hold 25% of all jobs in technology and are more likely to quit tech industry jobs. Similarly, LGBTQ employees are more likely to be bullied and harassed at work in the tech industry than non-LGBTQ employees. And 64% of LGBTQ people surveyed said that bullying and harassment contributed to leaving their jobs in the industry. And this inequality is worse in senior positions, i.e. the people who are actually making the major decisions about what gets made and how. A really fraught tool that a lot of digital designers use to simulate empathy and get around this demographics problem is personas. Personas are this methodology of creating imaginary people who you think represent different demographics who might experience your work. Sometimes it's based on real UX research, and sometimes it's just based on hunches. The problem is that they aren't real people, even if it is based on real research. You can't ask your persona if your design is easy to use or even if it's offensive. You're just having a conversation in your own head ultimately or with your own team. 
As a creator, even if you're making something experimental or fringe, I'd invite you to try instead to build a group of people who you trust, who support you in your work, who are different from you. You can do this informally by just emailing a demo to some friends, or you can invest in hiring a sensitivity consultant, but I swear, it's a thousand times easier just to ask someone their own opinion than to try and imagine what it might be. And I'd also invite you to embrace your own identity as something you're bringing to the conversation, not something you should anonymize away with false empathy and methodology. Humility in design is so much more valuable than empathy. So once we get that out of the way, we need to own our own experiences and get over ourselves a little bit. We want to talk about functionality. An exercise I find helpful is just to ask myself a few really strategic questions before I get too far in a project. What am I making? Why am I making it? Who is it for? And where will it live? There are a lot of great guides and resources out there about accessibility and platform compatibility and UX best practices. But I find it really important to actually articulate to myself the real heart of these questions, because sometimes the right answer isn't going to be covered by best practices. These so-called best practices are shaped by a really Western, male, commercialized perspective on design. So following a list of, say, how to optimize for mobile isn't going to get you out of some of these issues. As an example, say I want to make a game about playing with animals. I want to make it because I have some altruistic vision that there's not enough games that are designed with young girls in mind. So I'm going to design it for primary school age girls, and I want it to be a mobile app so that it's accessible and easy for children to have. So where do best practices fail in our example? Well, it's easier to find reports and investigations that compare left-handed versus right-handed users than ones that account for different sizes, shapes, and muscularity of users' hands, let alone the different sizes of cell phones these days. If you wanted to make a mobile game for primary school age girls, those best practices articles aren't going to apply. And again, you have to do the legwork on finding real people to help you solve these design issues. Again, if you're making something particularly experimental or artistic, sometimes the answers are, I'm making this for me because I want it, and it's going to live on my laptop. And that's 100% valid. But it's still worth articulating that to yourself before you get too carried away. So, let's talk about aesthetics. This is where I think you can really have some fun. Once you do the legwork on these other issues, and open yourself up to new kinds of design solutions. As digital creatives, we tend to get a bit myopic about how we relate to the history of design and aesthetics in general. I've been around long enough to have seen a bunch of digital design trends just in my short life, and the reality is that they are trends, not some kind of divine law. You literally don't have to do anything except answer the questions you want to answer, and those questions aren't going to be answered by using the most optimized 2020 UI kit. We are this tiny speck at the end of the chart, and we don't have to keep cannibalizing the past two years of trends to make our work. Now I quickly want to touch on the relationship between commercial goods and gender. Prior to the 1940s, products weren't really marketed separately to different genders. Gender-specific clothing for children is a result of specific manufacturing and retailing decisions in that era. In the 70s, that pendulum swung back to neutral clothing and toys for children as a result of the women's liberation movement. This is a pretty iconic ad from Lego. It features a little girl wearing gender-neutral clothing and holding an imaginary project that doesn't really speak to anything representative or at least representing gender roles of play. Then in the 80s, this all shifted back due to prenatal testing. Expectant parents began shopping for gendered merchandise during the pregnancy because marketers found out that there was a huge marketplace for this. The example on the right is this sort of classic McDonald's boy toy, girl toy marketing ploy. It became increasingly common at this time. It's also worth bringing up the pink tax when we're talking about gender and design. The pink tax is the extra amount that women pay for everyday products like razors, shampoo, haircuts, clothes, dry cleanings, and more. This tax applies to items that span a woman's entire life, 
including adult diapers. In digital design, there's now a new trend of femtech, which is essentially tacking on an additional fee to market these products with sleek, minimal packaging, effortless subscriptions, and organic or vegan ingredients. The aesthetics of these products are often intentionally unpinked. This is an example of a femtech brand selling tampons and pads at a pretty extreme markup in exchange for the experience of purchasing them from a clean, minimal website with neutral colors and pleasing product photography. While we're talking about clean minimalism, this is a good segue into the idea of reduced complexity. It's this idea that you're trying to distill a design experience into the most essential qualities. This is great for efficiency. For example, I could easily, easily toggle between Instagram and Airbnb and iTunes without really having to look for where the navigation bar is or wonder what I'm supposed to be doing. But it's not a space for creativity or identity. And I would argue that it also doesn't work out of the box. We see a lot of examples of how every app looks the same these days as evidence on them converging on some kind of design truth. But when these brands were building traction and figuring out what they wanted to be, they were weirder. They had personality. They experimented. You shouldn't go into a design aiming to be 2021 Instagram. You should aim to be yourself and maybe more like 2010 Instagram. The truth is also that the FANG companies, so Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, and certain FANG-like companies, which I would include Airbnb in this, have a radically different design process than most digital experiences. A-B testing is a really popular buzzword in digital design technology, but in my experience, very few companies actually do real A-B testing, at least not within their product and software design. A-B testing is this idea that you isolate one difference between two designs and see which performs better. If a company is not FANG or FANG-like in scale, they are not coming to these design decisions by extensive A-B testing. They are probably a small team of people scrambling to make deadlines by copying best practices. I have worked in and consulted for dozens of small to mid-sized startups, and none of them do true A-B testing outside of marketing growth campaigns. In fact, tech incubators like Y Combinator recommend that A-B testing for software is pretty worthless unless you're operating at a massive scale. Most of the design decisions you encounter outside of the major apps are just fallible people making a hunch with limited resources. We can really imagine these methodologies to be more like a game of telephone than design truths. This idea of reduced complexity also plays out in relation to gender in strange and frustrating ways. An easy example is Hims and Hers. Hims and Hers are sibling brands from the same telemedicine company. Both brands have a business model of selling subscriptions to medicines and personal care products that primarily have some relationship with shame. Basically, they're selling things that you might be too embarrassed to go buy at the store or have in your medicine cabinet with obvious packaging. Both brands use what we would think of as a very neutral design. They use earth tones, clean, minimal typography, very simple user interfaces. But even in these neutral designs, we can start to pick out some gender differences. I'd invite you to look at Take a look at these two screens. Both are selling the same product, a prescription strength face cream. Both buttons lead you to the same user flow, a process to schedule a virtual doctor visit to see if you can get the prescription. But if we dig deeper, there are a lot of subtle design differences that appeal to gender stereotypes. The men's copy is funnier, snappier, and unconcerned with what the product actually is. It even includes a pop culture reference. The women's copy is focused on ingredients and calling out specific flaws that women might be insecure about. Even the buttons have different copy. Men are getting a free visit and women are unlocking an offer. The only thing they have in common is the safety information that is obligated by law. 
Now, I can't speak to what is going on at Hims and Hers, but I've consulted on a similar telemedicine product, and I can say from experience that many of these products launch without even having a designer or engineer on staff, let alone one who is invested in best practices in terms of inclusion and accessibility. So if design aesthetics are trends and the methodology isn't real, maybe there's something freeing in that. Maybe we can get away from gendered tropes and boring designs by letting go of a lot of assumptions. As an activity, I'd invite you to make a mood board for your next digital project that has nothing digital in it. No apps, no interfaces, no hardware, no software. Look for paintings, films, books, architecture, nature, even food. Anything that excites you visually or in terms of function with what you're trying to make. If you're trying to make a meditation app, maybe pull in a painting of a quiet snowy forest. If you're making a digital chat experience, maybe add a photo of a picnic with your friends. This is an example of a mood board that I made for a recent digital project and e-commerce website. Notice that none of the things in the mood board are e-commerce websites. There are soda cans, zines, record covers, all things from, that are interesting visually, but have nothing to do with the specific digital experience I'm creating. My goal with these kinds of mood boards is to get myself to think away out of the box, not to just regurgitate what I'm seeing other designers doing. I see a lot of non-digital things end up in mood boards as conceptual inspiration, but I don't always see those things taken seriously towards the aesthetic. Try pulling a color palette directly from a film still, or make a texture from a leaf that you scan. Anything to break out of this habit of digital experiences only consuming digital experiences for inspiration. Even that original 2010 Instagram logo was making a direct tint reference to something non-digital. And by associating aesthetic choices with direct tangible experiences, we can get away from some of the gendered tropes we have around aesthetics. Say I'm making a video game about baseball and decide to pull my color palette from this photo of a stadium at sunset. Now I've empowered myself to use colors like pink and purple and coral in a sports game, something that you don't often see. It's coming directly from this tangible experience in a way that authorizes me to push my designs a bit. As a closing thought, I'd also invite you to just surround yourself with a rolling pool of inspiration that pushes your boundaries a bit in terms of ideas and stereotypes we all tend to have about gender and identity. This means more than just making mood boards of things you see on social media. Try watching a drag show or a football match if you haven't before and see what you can get excited about. You might find an amazing idea somewhere you least expect it. Now just to illustrate this, let's take a pretty boring, pretty, pretty bland UI for a football schedule and see what happens when we let go of what we think football should be. We throw in a little drag, and suddenly we have something that has a lot more pop and personality. It still is functional, it still is accessible, but it definitely says a lot more to me and stands out to me as brand. Well, thank you for making some time to look through this talk. Um, I invite you to rewatch it and genuinely try some of these exercises. These are exercises that I use regularly in my own creative practice, and I find them really freeing and helpful, and I hope that you do too. Thank you.